Welcome to episode 216 of Empty the Bench on the Empty the Bench podcast network. He's Tom Avato. I'm Nick Morgison. Follow us on social media at ETB Sports, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at ETB Sports. Follow the Empty the Bench podcast network at ETB Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at ETB Network. Follow our YouTube channel and subscribe, youtube.com slash ETB Network. Follow our website, etbpodcast.com, for all the latest blogs and information. Uh, if you want to listen to us on audio-only platforms, Acast, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and all that other uh, jazz and nonsense uh, to find our audio side. Uh, before we get started, uh, we did some expanding across the network as well. Uh, we've been working with uh, Wolf Spreads across on our Football Friday platform. Um, so check that out as well. You did it on Outsiders. Yeah, uh, so, right, yeah. I guess we can just... The- we can say right now that those who are familiar with Wolf Spreads uh, every week on Football Friday here on the Empty the Bench Network, you know that with Football Friday, we will make our little Wolf Spreads picks where we will, you know, you get 2000 fantasy dollars. It's fantasy sports and betting combined. It's fantasy betting, 2000 fantasy dollars, and you bet like you would normally. But the catch with it is that you get to do it against your friends, almost like a normal fantasy league. And whoever makes the best profit, uh, fantasy profit, that is, ends up winning for the week. So fun little competition. Good for those who are trying to get a little introduction into the sports gambling biz. And yeah, so shout Don't out to lose them. your house. Don't lose your house. Like do it safely. And then once you figure out how to do it safely, then foray into the real part of it and so what we'll do is you like on outsiders you're going to pick some fights and we'll we'll clip those out and show them to you guys across those accounts we'll make some picks on here during football season we'll do that and then when baseball and nhl and mlb and all that stuff because we'll do that as well but enough about that we have a lot of busy now i'm gonna say it again you jinxed it i jinxed it it's my turn this time i jinxed it because i said I think I said it in this way. Hey, Tom, I think we actually have a decent show. We're going to get through it. No problem. We went, from, we went from five banners all the way to 10. We doubled in the span of 24 hours. Yeah, so let, let, let's let break this down, and then we'll go through it. Uh, some unfortunate news out of the NBA. Uh, shocking news. Shocking, shocking. news uh, from out of the, the Golden State Warriors. We'll, we'll get to that. Um Raptors trade Pascal Siakam. This is not a shock, but it happened very quick, which I'm a little surprised about. Um, um, we, Bill Belichick. I was yeah. going to say, there's a story that happened after we finished recording, that, but on the day of the episode upload, so we never got a chance to get to it, and that is the story <laughs> about Bill Belichick officially leaving. And actually, it's a two-for-one at this point because they have already named his replacement. Well, that was in... Uh, well. I'll leave it. It was in that person's contract. We'll get to that. But also, our favorite owner is in the headlines all over again. And uh, that would be Knicks and Rangers owner James Dolan um, being accused of sexual misconduct and being uh, targeted as part of Harvey Weinstein's uh, group. Yeah. So we have a lot to break down on that. Also from the owner's world, uh, Jim Ursay. This story is a little bit on the older-ish side a month ago, but it's just coming out now. Um, I don't think you and I are surprised about that. Um, and also, we'll talk some games. How about that? We'll talk we, NFL wildcard round. We will talk some football on here. Yeah, because we have a tendency on this show to get very like in the weeds when it comes to investigating stories, but we'll but talk we will, the wildcard round. Yeah. We'll actually recap some games and we'll recap some coaching decisions that have happened. So I think we've got three in, in the aftermath of a uh, wildcard weekend. And then actually also one player, well, officially announcing he is done after wildcard weekend. And I'm not surprised by that. Um, good career, in my opinion. Most people don't think of it because it's not a skill position, but good career for this player. And we'll go through more of the coaching uh, craziness as well. All right, let's get started. Um, we'll start here. Uh, Golden State Warriors assistant coach uh, Dijon Milosevic 
I apologize if I butchered that name, dies at 46 after suffering uh, a heart attack. Um, I think they said this came after a private team dinner is what I was reading. Um, these are tough stories. You and I have done many, many tough stories over the years on this show. And that's the thing. The story about this, about uh, Coach Dijon, and then uh, the story about Jim Ursay actually came uh, one right after the other earlier on the day that we're recording this. And it's and it's because I remember I'll talk about this again later when we talk about with Ursay. But it's like we were just talking about a couple months ago about Ursay being out there in the picture as as the whole Jonathan Taylor feud uh, escalated, eventually calming down for him to JT to sign the extension. And now here with uh, Coach Dijon, uh, just that he was on the sidelines the other day coaching with the Golden State Warriors. And it just, seeing those kinds of stories, Nick, especially a story like this, where someone 46 years old suffers a heart attack, like one minute he's here, next day he's gone. It's like, makes you really think about life. Yeah, I mean. how quickly life can change. How quickly life can end. Yeah, the the way I see this story and the way I see this, like it was unfortunate. Now, the one thing I will bring up is coaching is tough in professional sports. There's a lot of pressure. We hear it, um, not to compare it because it's not the same thing, but they were talking about when Nick Saban retired at 72 years old and that he would get up at like 6 a.m. and go to bed at 2 a.m. Like, that's a lot of pressure for a lot of these guys. And think about the Warriors organization, who's been on their game for, well, until now, but what, what for the last decade? Like, they mm -hmm. constantly are playing more games, more travel, more everything, just being in the spotlight. It's a lot of pressure to be a coach, even not if you're not the head coach. Yeah, no, it absolutely is a lot of pressure. And I know that there are people and sometimes I fall into this kind of line of self that it's like, if you're constantly working that and keeping yourself busy, that that is the key to life. But as you kind of meant, uh, or say it's key to an expanded life. But at the same time, like you mentioned, the stress that some of these positions, uh, the stress that some of these very noteworthy positions in noteworthy organizations, whether it be sports or non-sports, and the stresses and tolls that it can take, that ultimately, you know, it's a matter. Of, it's a matter of taking care of your mind and your body. Um, obviously, we've talked in the past about several athletes where, you know, as the pressure continues to build, the mental health that gets affected. And now here, a case of, a uh, case of physical health and just the suddenness of this, that completely out of nowhere, he suffers this heart attack. Yeah, and what people need to realize, and we've been critical of athletes and coaches that make a lot of money. Okay, big deal. They make a lot of money. It's still hard work. People forget that just because they make a lot of money, that they have they're up endless days and nights putting together game plans, trying to get their players to perform. Because if they don't perform, they're out of the job. It's not the players that are out of the job. The coaches are out of the job. I mean, there are some cases where the players are out of the job, but obviously there are some teams, some sports organizations, leagues, in which it's the coach is the first to go. And so there's all that pressure, especially as you kind of mentioned, but a team like the Warriors, where the last decade, they have been the be all, the almost be all and end all of the NBA with all the championships that they've won. Now, as you kind of mentioned, you know, is that kind of going away now with the kind of position that the team it's in? It seems like it, but obviously, but obviously, they're going to try and continue to have the success for as long as they can. So, you know, it's still January; they still have a few months to go into the season. So, you know, when you are a coach in this league and you're a coach for a very major organization like this as you mentioned all the hours and stress that are put on and 
I don't know, man. It, this is just... I was just left in such a, st- a state of shock seeing this. I yeah. Mean, 46 years old. <laughs> yeah, and that's young in today's standards. Like, with all the medical technology of people living till 70, 80, 90 years old. Um, but everyone... And I'm going to call people hypocrites right now because people who say, oh, I can step in and be the head coach of a team. It's not that difficult. I, uh, I it's not. They show up and they hold a clipboard and basically run the team. It, it's not that simple. It's really not that simple. People need to realize that it's like doing any other job that you work nine to five, except this is more like nine to nine instead of nine to five not when when i mean 9 a.m to 9 a.m essentially like every day and and it's not just if you think of nick don't forget this is not just also the warriors who are going to be feeling this because uh john had impact on several players around the league including one uh including including one uh Okay. Including one uh Jokic. Yeah, Jokic. Yeah, that he was uh one of the mentors for Jokic before uh coming into the league. And look what Jokic has become in that regard, being one of the stars of the NBA. Um yeah, he, he I believe uh Jean came over, I think it was a few few years ago, 2021, something along those lines. He was out of Serbia. Serbia. Yeah. Serbia. So this is unfortunate. Like we've, like I said, you and I have done many stories over the years from major deaths in sports to marching the streets to COVID to we've seen it all. So obviously, and I see it across social media, like every team is putting out messages. The NBA, like as much as people want to be, hypocritical of the nba they can be a family when certain things happen you mean cynical of the nba i mean cynical of the nba but like they come together at the biggest moments when yeah the nba the nba and i'd even say the nfl have like the best kind of sports community actually i can't yeah i can say that but like i can't discredit the nhl because the nhl does for the most part as well uh MLB has its moments. Yeah. I mean, but again, obviously terrible story. Um, And hopefully everyone uh, thoughts and prayers with the family, obviously and the warriors. Uh, All right. Moving on to the other side, the business side of the NBA. Um, A major trade has happened. Yeah. Uh, The Raptors have traded Pascal Siakam and future second round pick to the Pacers for Bruce Brown, uh, Jordan Awara, Kira Lewis, two 2024 first round picks, and a 2026 first. Now, I'm not surprised. The The Raptors were like this. They right. were like but half and Nick, half. But Nick, the minute OG got traded to the Knicks, I said, this is rebuild mode. So kind of like what you were saying, that this Pascal trade, you know, is it, like you told me before we started recording, is it a matter of like shock? Not really. You can say shock and maybe how quick it kind of came together, but not really a surprise. Once OG was gone, Pascal was certainly going to be the next piece that fell. Now he's been on the rumored trading block for the last three years. Like this is a name. Everyone can say, Oh, when are the Raptors going to trade him? The, uh, now the only reason I think you said it, we talked about it and I agreed with it. Pascal was on the winning uh, Raptors team when they won. I think that was the Kawhi team also, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Um, but but just you saying that, Nick, you know, I get it. And I think there's a football team. I think it was the, trying to think right now, one of the football teams where they had just mentioned the other day that somebody was like the last remaining piece of a Super Bowl winning team. Oh, I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But um yeah, I can't remember which team that was. But this trade was going to happen at some point. Like the Raptors 
they just don't have the pieces to compete. And when you're in the NBA, unfortunately, either you're here or you're there. You're right, not in between. That, well, that was my point is that, you know, when you win a championship, you're so desperate to keep that uh, team together because it's always about, you know, that team led to success, that that team may have been the symbol of perfection. But at times, but number one, obviously, you need to improve as everybody else and all the different pieces move and players move on their own. Um, but then there's just, you know, there's a time in which you have to admit that whatever success that you had with whatever plan that you had, es uh, especially if it's a team that didn't win a championship, obviously the Raptors here did win a championship, that something has gone wrong. The plan has hit the wall. And at some point you just need to tear it down, blow it up, rebuild, whatever you want to say. And I think the Raptors have now gotten to that point where they recognize where they are. Right. And I got to give credit to the Pacers too. Like the Pacers have been a really good team uh, offensively, defensively competing with teams. Um, and what's the player's name? Tyler. Uh, I'm losing track of the player's name. He's the star on the team right now. Um, but he. Arrow. Oh, uh, Halliburton. Tyrese. Tyrese Halliburton, who's okay. been unbelievable so far this season. And now you're adding Pascal Siakam to uh, Tyrese Halliburton. That that's almost scary on top of itself. They didn't like the Pacers didn't trade like a, like an obscene amount of pieces, but and that's what I don't get about certain NBA trades over the years. Like you see names. I think the biggest trade away in this deal was the picks because that's what everyone cares about in the NBA picks. And I have to give credit that the Raptors managed to get not just three first round picks, but that two of them in this upcoming draft. So they have a chance to grab a couple of young stars. Actually, now here's my question because you follow the NBA a lot more than I do. Do the Raptors still have their own first round pick for 24? Did they trade that away? Um, I didn't, I, I, at least I didn't see it in this deal. I think one of the picks was also from the Pelicans, if I'm not yes, mistaken. One of, them, one of them was from the Pelicans. So, so I don't think they traded any of their picks. So no, that that, that, we'll that means Nick. No, no. Okay, yeah, they still have all that one pick of their own, which means they're gonna have three first round picks in this upcoming draft. Now, That's it, good. Yeah, I, I I get it. This is not the NFL draft. I know the NBA has a lot less picks when it comes to drafting. And it's not always a guarantee. You may see some players go to the G League. Some players go international. But the fact that they have three first-round picks in this upcoming draft, Nick, that is a good first step in building yourself back up, getting yourself a young, up-and-coming team. They could also go out and get a star if they really wanted to expand those picks. Now, that seems to be more of the option as of late. No one really likes building through the draft because the draft has kind of been a little bit of a up and down bust yeah. the past couple of years. But watch, you'll see like the next disgruntled star. Like, all right, uh, the Raptors have three picks. All right, we'll go to them. We'll ask for three picks to get the star in return. Like maybe they find their next Kawhi to help them win a championship in that regard that was but again that was a little bit lucky they had more pieces back then right much different team the pacers i got to give them a like a, a bravo like a, a clap because they're going for it like this is the clear definition of we're all in we're all in we're going to spend we're going to go out and get the pieces that we need and apparently Tyrese was one of the first to make the call to get him to come here. So great move by the Pacers. Toronto really had no choice. They're basically doing this. <laughs> They're knocking it down to zero and starting over because they literally have nothing in their, in their disposal except for picks. So I think both sides win in the regard because they got what they wanted. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think this is a deal. I think this is a perfect kind of deal to happen for both sides. Yeah, I, I don't think either side really lost. 
Yeah, um, I thought it made sense. All right, all let's right. move around a little. Um, where do we want to go? Actually, do you want to go to the Knicks Rangers story since we're talking? You know what? Yeah, yeah. Let's just let's just hit it. So, the the owner of the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers, the beloved James Dolan. And when I say beloved, I say that with every ounce of sarcasm in the world. <laughs> yeah, this is bad. So. Knicks Rangers owner James Dolan accused of sexual misconduct. Uh, the accuser connects Dolan to Harvey Weinstein. Now, you and I were trying to comb through this story. So this is another instance. Unfortunately, Nick, you're going to get the Sean Watson flashbacks. Another incident uh, supposedly at, involving a masseuse. massage therapist. Yes. And apparently the ac- the accusee, I know the name came out. Uh, I'm not going to say the name, uh, but basically, well, it's public. I guess it is public. Yeah. Uh, basically, the accuser has, when I say connects Dolan to Harvey Weinstein. So here's ba- the base of what's going on. The accuser is saying that James Dolan used his power as a means of coercing her into having relations. And apparently, James Dolan has been a friend of one Harvey Weinstein, the disgrace Mr. Hollywood himself. And apparently James Dolan's behaviors, according to the accuser, are connected to, of course, the behaviors of one Harvey Weinstein. And so James Dolan has all this influence between being his friend and being the owner of two New York sports franchises. The NBA has come out with a statement since basically saying they're going to do their due diligence. They're going to have the investigation. Same old, same old. The BS PR statement from the Adam Silver Commissioner's office machine. Oh, I was going to say, is this the Adam Silver office or is this the NBA communications? Oh, where do we have that banner still? Uh, yeah, there we go. Mike Bass. Yes. Go ahead. Mike Best, this is your time to be on that pedestal, to be up there to say, look, we're going to look into it, but we have no idea what happened, so we're not going to comment on it. We're not going to say anything. We don't think James Dolan's a jerk, regardless. But, you know, I I, I was going to say. I was going to say, I don't know about that last part about, uh, well, we don't think James Dolan's a jerk. Uh, James Dolan has had his run-ins with several people around the league, fans and other officials. Yeah, I mean, this is bad. Like, There's a lot. Now, I said this to you the other night. We don't know what's true and what's not. We have no idea. Right. This could be a case where somebody's making an accusation and it's just thrown out in court because there's nothing here. So there's that front of it that you have to give. Remember, this is America, so we still have to go with the innocent until proven guilty. There, there's another part of this, too, which so she's 38 right now. This mm-hmm. happened when she was 27. But now here's the thing. She filed the court, uh, uh, the, filed the uh, suit when it came to uh, and the charges in California. Correct. So, but again, eleven years. I don't. How, how does that stand? I don't know. Well, it depends upon the statute of limitations. The thing is, if this is California and New York, because the statute. Okay, so actually, Nick, because I know we did some research for this before, but in at the start of two thousand twenty-three. Uh, California expanded statute of limitations for sexual assault claims, which permits survivors to file legal claims for sexual assault that happened years ago. Is there a uh, number on that, though? Because that okay. that's very broad. For te- sexual assaults that occurred between January 1st, 2009, January 1st, 2019, uh, there is a three-year look-back window permitting sur- survivors to file claims for sexual assault beginning January 1st, 2023, ending December 31st, 2026. 
So I'm assuming she's filing the charges under that window. Right. But if you look at the numbers, and again, I'm not defending James Dolan. I I, I can't stand I know. James Dolan. I know. But... The, the thing we had researched that it was 10 years. But with this window opportunity, I guess this is another chance for her to come forward. I guess, And I guess now she feels comfortable coming forward with this accusation. Now, of all the stuff that we read in the article, if it's true, he's got to be gone. Like, from owning the Knicks, owning the Rangers. Um, and if they prove that this is true, he might be a dead duck walking on business. Yeah. So, uh, that's the thing. Obviously, uh, that's the thing. Obviously, we just, as I just said, innocent and prove, until proven guilty. But if it does end up being true, yeah, this is a very bad look. And it it would be a mistake. And maybe I say this with a little Knicks Rangers bias, considering all the suffering we've had to do under James Dolan. But if something like this is true, it would be a grave mistake on Adam Silver, uh, Adam Silver's part for him to continue to own the Knicks and Gary Bettman's part for him to continue to own the New York Rangers. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Adam Adam Silver was a brand new commissioner when the whole Clippers thing happened, right? Correct. That was his first big impact. Donald Sterling. Um, Now, this, I don't know if this falls under the same regard as that, but... Could you at least see Dolan being suspended from the day-to-day operation, something like a George Steinbrenner when he was banned for like three years who cares <laughs> i mean who cares if he's suspended from the operations he, he can talk from a million miles away and tell people what to do fair enough I'm, I'm just saying is there something else is there something else that you think either batman or silver will do no it, it, this is what do they call it it's it's um what are the, what's the saying it's black and white like it's it's right there like it's there's no in between there. Either so, he goes or he's not. So either so either he goes or it's gonna be an Adam Silver slip up. I'm not throwing the banner out there yet because obviously this is not yet. It might be a preemptive Adam Silver slip up. Right. And but that's only if these charges are true. Right. If the charges are true, his ass better be shown the door and never be allowed back in any professional sports league ever again. If it's not, then it's gonna be business as usual. Well, yeah, because if they have no case, then they have no case and it gets thrown out. And the problem is with public figures is they can't defend themselves because of who they are as people. Right. This happens all the time with celebrities. Oh, well, uh, you're you're defaming me. Well, how do you defame someone who is a public figure? Well, I mean. Dolan already has a bad enough reputation as it is across the leagues and with his fan bases and other officials. And you get my point. And the other thing is, I don't blame the lawyer for James Dolan being pissed off in the sense of you have the magic words, Harvey Weinstein being associated with you as an individual. That's bad. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember the direct quote, but the woman said like, Oh well, uh, my best friend is uh the Harvey Weinstein or whatever the quote that he cl- she claims he said, and I was like, whoa, like that's a major accusation. That's not just a major accusation. That's a life to business killer mm-hmm. <laughs> in that regard. And I I have the story here, and I'm trying to find the quote, but. It's not good. It's like I said, if he is proven guilty, he can't be the owner of the Knicks. He can't be the owner of the Rangers. He can't be in any professional leagues. He does a lot of business uh, for Mad- with Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Like JD and the straight shots would have to be disbanded. <laughs> I don't think anyone would be too upset with that, to be honest. <laughs> um, but some of the quotes I'm seeing that she's saying that Dolan became quote, extremely assertive and pressured Miss Croft into unwanted 
Yeah. Well, I said, co coerced, her, coerced her with uh, supposedly with her, um, I mean, with his power. And it says uh, Dolan paid, she's claiming Dolan paid for the hotel where she was staying in LA. Uh, Weinstein, she alleged, introduced himself as one of Dolan's best friends. That go. was the quote. And if that's the case, that's even worse. There's no coming back from this if this is proven innocent. But what do we say? Innocent till proven guilty. Mm -hmm. We don't want a situation that we just were dealing with over the past couple of weeks with uh, McAfee and, and Jimmy Kimmel where we're making accusations. Oh, God, yeah. Well, listen, one way or another, whether he's innocent or guilty, Nick, this does not improve my look at James Dolan. The he, reputation is damaged, regardless well, if it's innocent or not. Well, well, reputation damaged, but yes, but you know what? As, as much as I'm saying we're saying innocent until proven guilty, James Dolan is just he's still a jerk. And the one that the irony, I'll end it on this. The remember I told you about the song title? Yeah. From JD and the straight shots or whatever they did. So it says, uh, Dolan, who served as a member of the board of directors for the Weinstein Company, by oh. the way, in 2015 and 2016, released a song with his band titled I Should Have Known, which he later connected in part to Weinstein. Oh. These, now, let me be very clear so that I don't we don't get a freaking letter from the Dolan lawyers. Oh. This is, this is an ESPN story. Yeah. So they know a lot more than we do. Well, Dolan, if I'm not mistaken, Dolan has had his clashes with ESPN before, at least on, well, didn't he have a clash with Michael K and his show a couple of times? Well, because that was the whole incident that happened with, um, Oakley at the stadium, yeah. which again, I think Dolan and his team mishandled. Um, oh, don't, worry. don't worry, Nick. We're going to be next to be banned from Madison Square Garden. Probably. Also, you had the uh, screening yeah, yeah. technology, which right. was banning people from this. That was a whole nother issue. Throwing, throwing the fan out for saying sell the team. Well, the uh, the uh, what's it called? The banner holding up the banner. Uh, but I don't know. <sighs> this is not good. We're going to hear more about this, I bet. Yeah. All right. Let's get to the football side of things. The first thing, before we get to this week's stuff, we have to talk about the story that we didn't get a chance to because it broke after our recording, right before we were going to go on the air. Bill Belichick has officially, as we said even during last week's episode, that we had a feeling it was going to happen. It has happened after over after 20 plus years as the man on the, on the sidelines leading the New England Patriots to several Super Bowls working in tandem with Tom Brady, Bill Belichick's run in New England is over. By the way, that was bizarre watching the press conference with Bill and uh, Rob, uh, Robert Kraft and him actually speaking normally. And, and him, him joking that, oh, I haven't seen this many cameras a year for us since we signed Tebow. And Tebow quote tweeted the, the video on social media, which was funny, by the way. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. But this is not a surprise. People are acting yeah. shocked which is kind of shocking to me because I guarantee you they probably knew this three to four months ago. They knew it. The, the Patriots are not dumb. Well, we have the reports from the NBC boss, uh, NBC sports, Boston insiders that were saying that this decision probably may have been made after the loss in Germany uh, against the Colts um, was the decision officially made that no but i think it kind of was in craft's mind of maybe it is time to move forward and honestly nick we talk about with the whole raptor story that there is a time in which it is time to tear things down and build things back up again and here's another example the patriots this long-running dynasty you have to give credit where credit is due as much as i swallow pride in saying that all those championships that they've won since Brady first came to the scene in uh, 2001, 2002. And that run, that dynasty, you know, nearly 20 years of a dynasty in New England. But that time is over. It's yeah, time, now for, it's, it's yeah. time now for new beginnings. And 
unfortunately, after a season like they've had, you know, where they had so few wins, s- seeing the Patriots at the bottom of the AFC standings, the bottom, of, the near the bottom of the NFL, after all this time, since maybe the early 90s, at some point, Nick, it's time to move forward. And unfortunately, it seems to be a time where, you know, the Patriots need a new start. And I don't think even even if Bill even if Bill were to have been offered to stay, Nick, I don't think Bill Belichick would be willing to wait around for a team that's completely rebuilding. I don't think that's Belichick's foray foray into keeping a team. Like he he needs a team that has a quarterback, which right now is a shit show and in New England, they don't have a quarterback. Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi is not the answer to the New well, England Bailey future. Zappi, well, Bailey Zappi was never the answer, but Mac. But the reason he was in the spotlight was because of Mac Jones. Which, I mean, stick a fork in him. He's done. He's done. He has no chance of being a starting quarterback in this league. But I want to point out because people is one people were shocked. Don't be shocked. This was probably determined like three, four, five months ago. Right. Two. Which- which I'm oh, not good. shocked. I'm sorry, Nick. I'm not shocked, but at the same time, it is one of those things where it's like, you know, 2001, 2002. So I would have been six, seven years old, but at seven years old at that point. So it's like ever since then, when they won their first uh, Super Bowl championship, at least my lifetime watching that, you know, it's like a seven year old. And now here I am at the age of 29. It's like all this time later. The only thing really I have ever known in football with the Patriots, Nick, has been. Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. One of those shoes fell a few years ago when he left for Tampa Bay, and now the other shoe has just dropped. So it's like, wow, all this time. I mean, Nick, we just at left a wild card round, an NFL playoff. We're in the middle of an NFL playoffs for the first time in nearly 30 years, Nick, actually more like 25, no Peyton Manning and no Tom Brady. Yeah, th- and just to take that point even further, think about the amount of coaches that we had in retirement, Nick Saban, uh, Bill Belichick leaving. Right. Uh, who else was on the, uh, Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll leaving. Not be, yeah. Not being offered a spot back. Right. Like these are guys we've known from the whole time we started watching football and now they are not head coaches anymore. Um, number two, people are saying why Jared Mayo, why? Because I think he was like a linebackers coach. Yes, yes. and 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 honestly, I, I know the direction you're going to go with it, and that's a fair reason. But I think it is still a fair question of if Mayo is the right fit for this team. Well, what people don't realize, because from the inside or point of view, mm-hmm. it was written in Mayo's contract that he was going to be the takeover guy once Belichick stepped away, retired, moved on. So they didn't have to go through the, um, what's it called, process in the NFL for coaching. The Rooney rule. The Rooney rule stuff. Because it was already pre-written, so the NFL let that pass because they already had their coach. Um, Will it be the right fit? Who knows? It's going to take four, five, six years to really see if he gets that long to see if that really fits. Um, but with the Patriots, I mean, at least we could say with Mayo is that it's the start of a new beginning because I'm highly suspecting with a third overall pick in this year's draft, they're going to draft either Caleb Williams or May or one of these quarterbacks that's coming out of college. Well, did you see that Caleb Williams is already causing a stir over the past week or so? Well, we already established with Caleb Williams, he has a bit of uh, drama to him. There were only like five teams or so that he had previously said he was willing to play for. It was like the Vikings, the Giants, the Cowboys. I don't remember if the Patriots were on that list. I don't think they were, but um, he came out over the last week and said, I want to guarantee that I will not be picked by the Bears at the first overall pick. Oh, boy. Didn't... If I'm not mistaken, didn't somebody else try to... Didn't Eli try to do that? Not only did Eli do that, Eli managed to get it to go because the Giants drafted Phillip Rivers and then the two... The swap. Yeah, Yeah. they traded for one another. Um, 
But honestly, it's funny that you say that, Nick, because there are rumors right now that the Bears may trade Justin Fields so they can take a quarterback number one. And one of those rumored places, Nick, is the Atlanta Falcons, who have been going off with the, it was a Taylor Hannick. Taylor Heineke and uh, Desmond Ritter the last couple of years. And Nick, there were a couple of teams, two teams in particular that Belichick has supposedly been connected with. One of those jobs, Nick is with the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, I did see that. Uh, I don't know. I I'm kind of up in the air. Obviously they have the uh, Drake at running back. Um, they have some no, no, yeah, younger. You mean, Drake, you mean Drake London at receiver. Uh, I mean, uh, Drake London receiver, and they have uh, oh, Bijan. Bijan. Uh, Bijan, excuse me. Oy. Bijan, a uh, running back who, for some reason, couldn't score in the red zone all season. Well, let's, well, let's be clear. And even, and even Arthur Blank seemed to admit it when he fired Arthur Smith, is that, you know, you have all those young weapons. And I say it again, Nick. I've been ranting about this the past couple of football Fridays. The Atlanta Falcons should have been the NFC South champions. They should have played much better. With the kind of talents that they had, the time, the kind of talents that have been flashed the last couple of seasons with Drake London and Kyle Pitts, and what and the good moments that you did see in, with Bijan here in his rookie season, they should have been a lot better. Actually, I don't know if I want to say a lot better than what they were, but they should have been better with what they were. Because now, if you get a real quarterback in there, you know I'm not Fields' biggest fan, but I think Fields is an upgrade over Desmond Ritter and Taylor Heineke. If you put Fields in there, I think you have a much better productive offense. Uh, and, and, and if you get a coach in there like Belichick, I think that would do, if they manage to do that, and do I have questions of that? It's going to be a big success? Yes. But I think that at the very least, considering the weak nature of the NFC South, the Atlanta Falcons would have the chance to usurp the box of their hold on that division. I still think there's a another team out there that's a much better yeah and i i I, you and i are in agreement on that the other team that he belichick has been connected with which is the los angeles Chargers. because if you're bill belichick think about what you would have at your disposal justin herbert austin eckler mike williams keenan allen uh gerald everett at tight end uh i obviously the defense would need a lot a lot of help but the offensive pieces that you have there like that would be, I think Belichick would really desire that, especially because they are another team. The Chargers, actually, they're the ones we say they should be played. They should have played a lot better than they have the last couple of seasons. Yeah, and obviously, you and I had a distaste for Mister Head Coach over there in uh, Chargerville. Yeah. Um, but Herbert is like is the perfect quarterback for Belichick to pick up on. Uh, they have Eckler. They have some pieces. That is a Belichick team in every way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. That is, re- it's ready for the taking for Belichick to take. Now you hear all these rumors with Harbaugh, which, by the way, I think he's going back to Michigan. I don't think we have anything to worry about, worry about that. that. I think he's I just using that as bait, to, to be honest. Right. But um, if Belichick doesn't end up in with the Chargers, I'd be very shocked. But I would be shocked as well, but I think the Falcons are a decent... I think the Falcons like, are still a decent number two, as long as... as long as the Falcons make some sort... if they can get this deal done with the Bears and get Fields. Now, I don't know why Fields has a ton of value. Like, he hasn't been great. I know he had a better second half, and the Bears were more competitive in games. But- Right. Now, I'm not Fields' biggest fan either, Nick, but it just leaves this question. How is it that, you know, you see all these firings and the not returning is the Belichick, the Pete Carroll, the Mike Vrabel. Uh, it, it just baffles me that for whatever reason, they're sticking with Eberflus. Yeah, that was probably the biggest shock of the offseason. I mean, to see guys like... Um... Oh, the Tennessee head coach being fired. Vrabel. Yeah. Uh, being fired, which, by the way, he will find a job at some point. Right. Uh, well, I said it last week. I think actually the clip went out recently, uh, recently uh, from the time of recording this, Nick. Uh, the fact, the reason that he is fired, you know, where has Tennessee had the last rough couple of seasons? Yes. But even I had said in the last week episode, 
Tennessee is another one of those teams that got tearing it down. They're going to start to go young again, and they need a rebuild. Derek, yeah. which, is funny, which is funny because Derek Henry actually just came out and said, yeah, it seems like his time with the Titans is done, but he's not going to retire. He's he's still looking for – a he's looking to play for a contender. And you know what? I laugh at that because you know what one of the teams I heard that was possibly in for the services? Oh, no. How about them cowboys? Oh, can you imagine Derrick Henry and Tony Pollard on the same team? First of all, I don't think there'd be enough carries for both of those guys, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but would they would they drop Pollard to a two? Like or 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 they keep Pretty Pollard good. as the one and they oh, use yeah. Derrick Henry as your T D guy and in, in, Oh, like like Ezekiel Elliott in New England. But I think Derrick Henry is built way better, even at an older <laughs> career wise. Yeah, like by far, Nick, by far. So I could see like I could see uh Derrick Henry being the spell guy. Like say Tony Pollard's been out on the field for a long period of time. So like you mean Der- so you mean Derrick Henry being like the third down guy, the red zone guy? I, I think Derrick Henry's one of the best guys in the red zone in the history of running backs. Like that that's where he lives. Mm-hmm. Just don't tell B. John Robinson that because maybe you should learn a thing or two about the red zone. But Aww. that would be insane to have Derrick Henry behind Tony Pollard. That would be. The expectations would be far too high at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no question. Uh, this story is a little older, but it's actually very recent. So this deals with Jim Ursay. So this took place back on December 8th. However, it's just coming out now. TMZ filed. I don't know. If, I don't think it was a true FOIA act, but it was some sort of information. It was an were... unconscious person report. Okay, thank you. It was an unconscious person report. It was some, I was going to say, it was some form of official public file that they could, information so, file that they could get. Yes, yeah, someone actually, they, they had to file because apparently they sent uh, fire authorities and uh, ambulance authorities. So someone had a call. Yeah. Uh, basically, cult owner Jim Ursay was found unresponsive. As you mentioned, medical personnel, fire personnel entered his home. Found him unresponsive, struggling to breathe, basically turning a shade of blue or purple. He was given Narcan. He was able to uh, be woken up. Uh, there's fears that he may have overdosed on something, but it seems like in these statements now that have been coming out, everyone's trying to downplay that or ignore it or say it's not true. Um, well, it goes back, first of all, it goes back to what I said before when we were... Uh, we were talking about Coach Dijon. Uh, you know, it's it's exactly what I said before about how with Ursay seeing that that's those two stories in the same point. Uh, and especially with in a case like Ursay when it comes to this show, because it wasn't that long ago. It was only at the towards the end of 2023, Nick. We were talking about all that feuding between him and uh, Jonathan Taylor. And it's like all of a sudden that there was a chance Jim Ursay could have been gone here. It's like Jeez, how quickly life, like I said, how quickly life can just flip upside down. Right. And on top of that, first of all, you and I don't like Jim Ursay. Like, just the way he acts. I'm not the biggest Ursay fan. No. I've never been a fan of Ursay, even going back to the Peyton Manning days. Like, it's just, Ursay has this me versus the world vibe where it's my way. Or I tell you to kick rocks. And that's what he was doing to uh, uh, what was the uh, for running back for the contract negotiations Taylor. with the uh, right with Taylor. And basically, I remember like they were going back and forth on the bus and like they couldn't agree. And wasn't it true, if I'm not mistaken, he's like, oh, I'll find a uh, running back to essentially replace you. Yeah, basically, the claim was, uh, you know, oh, uh, what does it matter? You know what? myself or JT do today because we could be forgotten tomorrow. But Jonathan Taylor kept them in it all the way to the end. Yeah. I mean, it's not fair what he did. I mean, he eventually got a contract, but um, that team does not compete without two players. Jonathan Taylor and Gardner Minshew. Right. They They don't compete. 
Right. And I mean, credit to Minshew and himself because he was a he wasn't the starter. He only took the reins because Anthony Richardson went down. It's going to be interesting to see what this Colts team looks like now uh, with Anthony Richardson recovering from an injury in his rookie season. Gardner Minshew is going to get a contract to come back with the Colts, and it's not going to be cheap because he's now proven he could start. And had he now has it been perfect? Absolutely not. It has not been perfect. But we've seen Gardner Minshew have what three hundred yard games for yeah. some games. Like you have to agree. Like I was shocked when I saw it. Like the guy has an arm that we didn't realize. Now we all know Gardner Minshew kind of got clowned upon because of all the stuff he did off the field and. Oh. Mustache Manny is fantastic, Nick. It's fantastic, but he got clowned nonstop for the stuff he was doing off the field. But now he proved he's an NFL arm in the league. He's he's reliable. He can be reliable. And we'll talk about another quarterback who's still in the playoffs that falls into that same regard. Um, I guess we could do that now. The NFL wild card round. Now, yeah, by the way, this was this was fantastic. I enjoyed the wild card weekend. I, I, Fantastic. I, I, yeah. Uh, let's start from the top, Nick. Uh, Texans over the Browns, 45 to 14. I think this was probably one of the most, if it wasn't for a certain other game we'll get to, I would have said that that was the most shocking outcome. Not that the Texans won, but in the way that they won. Because obviously... You know, we can say whatever about Flacco. But, Nick, all that all last football Friday, me and a couple others were hyping the defense. And Cleveland had one of the best defenses in the whole NFL. And the Texans' offense just made them like, look like complete chumps. And I don't think that's on, the te- that's on the Browns because maybe it's a little biased in me, Nick, but I have to give the Browns credit where it's due because – they lost Deshaun Watson. They lost Nick Chubb. They lost several key pieces on their offensive defensive line. And they still managed to finish 11-6 and six right behind the Ravens in the division. The Ravens were the number one team. So you got to give credit there that they may actually managed to get this far with all of their injuries. And, do. I don't think, and I don't think that this loss, Nick, as bad as a blowout it is, and I will defend them tomorrow on Football Friday, it's not a matter of the Browns being bad. It's a matter of, Nick, I think a performance like this. I mean, this was historical. C.J. Stroud's performance in his first playoff game, they were comparing to uh, Aaron Rodgers, and I think it was either Peyton or either Peyton or Tom. In their I would say game. I would say Peyton because that it seemed like that performance. Like he just came out and was gunslinging from the word go. And C.J., that's the thing, Nick. It's not a testament of God how bad the Browns were. It's how good CJ Stroud is. CJ Absolutely Stroud it was. Proven, CJ Stroud has proven that he is he is not just NFL ready. He is NFL caliber. He is NFL excellent. Now, are there going to be the concerns, all the pressure in a sophomore season, regardless of how Houston finishes? Absolutely. But I if of all these different quarterbacks to come out in the last, not just this year's draft class, Nick, because that's a given with Richardson uh, not being injured and Bryce Young not living up to potential. I would say, Nick, stretching back the last few years, even to the Trevor Lawrence 2021 draft, the Burrow to uh, Herbert 2020 draft, CJ Stroud is on, CJ Stroud is on that Burrow and is on that Burrow level. He is on that Herbert level. Like, yeah, he is phenomenal, and he is going to be, if he's not already, potentially the top young uh, quarterback in this uh, NFL. Yeah, CJ Stroud is going to be around for a long time. Uh, the Texans are probably happy now, considering they see what happened to their other quarterback that was in the matchup they were playing against and never played. Um, yes, I will continue to take shots at Sean Watson. I don't care. <laughs> um, but CJ Stroud just looks ready and he's going to be with this team for the next 10 to 15 years. Cause one, he doesn't do anything to get himself hurt. Now he kind of goes against the traditional norms of today's NFL, where you usually can use your legs to get a first down. That's not his game. At he's a all. Cannon. He is a he's cannon. a cannon. He's Eli. I hate to say it, but he's Eli. <laughs> 
I, and, Maybe and that's why are, I like him. <laughs> and people are going to say, like, Nick, what do you mean? And so I'll explain it in a couple of ways. <laughs> Eli was a gunslinger. People don't think it, but he is. He was never going to, unless he was forced and flushed out of the pocket to run. CJ Stroud is doing the same thing. Unless you flush him out of the pocket. Now, he's a little bit younger now, so he can run for first. I think we saw him quite a few times mm -hmm. run for first downs, but you're going to, you're, he's looking down the field for that 30, 40, 50 yard throw. And to be honest, this game could have been a blowout even further if it wasn't for a few drops on the other side of the ball. Like mm -hmm. the Strout throws are on the money. It's on the other side who's catching the football is the big problem. But you know what? But Nico Collins, uh, six, 96 yards on six receptions for him. Revin Jordan, 76 yards, one reception. Uh, Mechie, 44 yards. I, so you got to give credit. And and the other thing, Nick, we talk about injuries. This team lost Tank Dell earlier in the season. If Could you imagine what they would have been like with Tank Dell there? But I do see your point in that. Maybe if you get one more no-name kind of no-name kind of receiver <laughs> that this team could maybe get to the next level. What was Singletary's numbers, by the way? Uh, so 66 yards, 13 rushes, one touchdown, and then four yards on three receptions. He has been fantastic over the last, like the second half of the season. I think he proved that. I think he proved that he was reliable up in Buffalo, and now here in Houston, he's finding a groove, another groove. And also, he's great because he's got that uh, reception option, like a lot of running backs. That was the weirdest thing this year in the NFL. Running backs were being slotted out a lot this year. Singletary does that well. Um, Bijan. A Swift, Sw a Bijan does it well. DeAndre Swift does it well <coughs> when the Eagles decide to uh, score. Um, McCaffrey is probably the top. Up. <laughs> uh, up and above, beyond. And that's what makes him such a dual threat ever since he went to the Niners, that he can catch the ball, he can run the ball, he can do everything. I'm surprised he doesn't even, he's not the quarterback and throwing touchdowns. But that's the big difference. Singletary can catch passes. And that kind of makes him a dual threat. Nico Collins looked great, almost 100 yard game. Mm -hmm. um, the Browns were down from the word go in the first quarter. Yeah. And that's the problem. In a playoff game, you just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And the, and the Texans were at home. Yeah. And, and the Browns had all those injuries that they went through. So listen. Browns are going to get another shot next year. Once they are healthier, I think they're. I think they have all the potential. So, like right. I said, with a team like they have this year to go eleven and six, that means imagine what they could be like fully healthy. They can compete with the Ravens for the AFC North. Now, my question would be: Is Deshaun Watson? How do you yeah. see that? Unfortunately, they they dug their grave. They got to play him. But do you think that? maybe going with like the Flack Flacco who's got the playoff experience. What's Deshaun? Deshaun's got nothing. I mean Deshaun <clears throat> has some wins in the playoffs. Right, but again, how long has it been since he's thrown a football now? I mean <clears throat> But they made their grave. They already paid him all this money. They're gonna have it's gonna be a business move, Nick. They're gonna have uh, no you're right. No doubt. Um all right. Well where do we uh, go on this uh, recap? Let's just go right to the next game. The Peacock exclusive Chiefs versus Dolphins. Uh, so the Chiefs end up winning this game. It's pretty much a blowout, twenty-six to seven. Uh, there were two, only two touchdowns. Actually, there were three touchdowns in this game, Nick. Two by the Chiefs. One in the first quarter uh, by Rishi Rice. The other was from a uh, rushing touchdown by Isaiah Pacheco. The rest of it, Nick, was death by field goal. Harrison Bucker, Harrison Bucker, Harrison Bucker, Harrison Bucker. And you know what? The Dolphins proved that they can't show up in big games. They they've proved it. And Tua Tua looked lost in the cold weather. We all said it that he was going to look. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they were not good. The Chiefs managed to stuff them. And honestly, Nick, I think this was a game where we said that the cold weather was going to affect both teams. The Chiefs did what they had to do, Nick. To get around the cold weather, Dolphins could plain and simple. 199, 199 uh, yards. 
Yeah, 20 for 39, one passing touchdown, interception, two times sacked. The Mostert only had 33 yards. Tua had 25 rushing yards. The, the rushing game got completely decimated in Miami. And HM was a non factor whatsoever. Yeah. I remember, I think you were one of the ones that said that HM would have to be a factor to really yeah. make this team compete. Now, Waddle did end up playing. Uh, he was a non factor. Two receptions. Really. 31 yards. Uh, the only real factor here was Tyreek. Uh, and, and it wasn't even a, it was a low standard game for him. Five receptions for 62 yards. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's number one. I guess the Dolphins really can't play in cold weather. And number two, like, like, like we were saying on football Friday, at this point, the Dolphins are a team where they can dominate the bad teams, but put them up against the bigger team. Lights go up. Game is on. They choke. Now, even if they had won, who would they have, would who would they have played? They would have played the Ravens. The Ravens. They probably would have played the Ravens. Yeah, the Ravens would have decimated them. They would have been they destroyed would, one right. way or the other because Dolphins would have had to go on the road anyway. So, mm -hmm. I just I think it was a one and done, which is kind of insane if you think about it. Because everyone said, "Oh my God, the Dolphins have Waddle and Tyreek and Mosert and Achan and and Waddle like." <clears throat> Excuse me. They have all the offensive pieces, but their defense just the, did not live up at all whatsoever. Oh. And like the last couple of games, Tua, including back to the regular season, he has not gone over the yards number that was put out on like uh, DraftKings or even on Wolf Spreads. I looked on there too. Like yeah. he has not gone over the number that they put out like the last three or four games. Yeah. I mean, the Dolphins have been a really concerning team the last month. To think, Nick, all they had to do in, over the course of December was win another game or two to get the division, and they couldn't do it. Now, and it, it's like I what just, we talked about okay. on Football Friday. No, but it's like we mentioned on Football Friday. I think it was – I forget who said that they felt bad, and I was on the side of Johnny. No, I don't feel bad. Win the game. You win, that game, you. Buffalo, you win that game against Buffalo, then you're at home hosting the Steelers, which would have been a win for the Dolphins. I don't know that that would have been interesting too. Like I know the Steelers are dysfunctional, but like it would have been interesting to see if the Steelers actually kept them uh, c competitive or alive. Mm -hmm. But the Chiefs, Mahomes did exactly what he had to do, and I think I said it on Football Friday. What happens to the Chiefs and Mahomes once the switch turns on? Different team, different quarterback. Correct, but. We will see this coming weekend in Buffalo. That's going to be the true test of how how much of a flip did that that you're talking about. And if that's really the most entertaining happen. game on the divisional watch, in my opinion, especially because this is not like in past years where Buffalo travels to them. This year, they got to go to Buffalo, especially in that weather pattern. Oi, I mean, yeah. that I don't even know what to say about that. But the Chiefs. I think the Chiefs are built better to compete. If the Dolphins had won, I think they would have been knocked down in Baltimore. Uh, yeah. Um, by the way, Peacock, all the numbers that, that they got, 30, what was it, 35 million views? 35.6 million views. Um, I just, am I surprised that this is what they're doing? This is just proving the NFL's point that, digital and streaming is where everything is going. Yep. So basically going forward, you're going to need a Peacock uh, subscription, an Amazon subscription. Basically, if you want to watch the NFL, you got to spend your money. Welcome to cable 2.0, ladies and gentlemen. If you uh, think about it, they are the new cable. Yeah. All right, Nick. Where is uh -oh. it? How about them cowboy? <laughs> How about them cowboy? <laughs> I think all of us were just like excited to see the Nick, Cowboys were out. Nick, Nick, I know you you wanted me to do a video for Football Friday, but I need to say it here. I will never be able to top what Tree did of three minutes of just laughing over footage of the, of the Cowboys sucking. That is the video to watch. That was good. I did see that. Um, but what's unbelievable to me in this game. One that the Packers absolutely destroyed them before halftime. Uh, but I look at the numbers. 
Dak was now rem, keep this number in mind: forty-one completions out of sixty attempts, four hundred and three yards, three touchdowns, two picks, four sacks, and they lost by sixteen. Now, listen. Let me be clear. Yeah, m- most of that came during the second half. The first half, yeah, they sucked. But Nick. As much as I'm not the biggest Cowboys fan, I'm a Cowboys hater, I should say. <laughs> um, listen, it, it goes back to Nick, the argument that we made because we talked about the Chargers earlier with Justin Herbert. Remember how we all said, Joe, oh, I didn't know Justin Herbert uh, was able to play defense. Same thing. I didn't know Dak was able to play defense because all that talk that I did on Football Friday about how Dan Quinn has made this Dallas defense what it was. And Jordan Love and and Aaron Jones completely owned them. Well, I'll admit it again. I said it on Football Friday. I said it here. Jordan Love is playing good football right now. Like, yeah, yeah. Mo- you know how they say momentum comes in swings. Mm-hmm. I like, and I know they're going to play the Niners, and the Niners are probably going to beat the crap out of the Packers. But yes. maybe momentum makes it a competitive game. Who knows? I don't know. But <laughs> Jordan Love looked amazing in this game. Like. His throws were being hit, didn't struggle under the pressure, hit the third downs, the third and mediums. Mm-hmm. Like and the Cowboys like- just look lost defensively. And Nick, I actually, I think this is what I was referring to before, talking about Jordan Love, because they showed Aaron Rodgers' first playoff game, Brett Favre's first playoff game. And he played, Jordan Love played to Favre and Rodgers' level in their first playoff games. Like, and you got to hope as a Packers fan, you know, you saw the torch pass from Favre to Rodgers and how Rodgers, you know, still got him a soup, one Super Bowl in uh, 2011. You got to hope that that performance against Dallas and being the first number seven seed to be a two seed in this new expanded playoff format. You got to hope that's a good sign that there is a bright future under Jordan Love's watch. I hope so. And I'm, I, you know what? And I have no hate for Jordan Love. I, I think he could be a good quarterback. If he's going to play like this, then maybe and we're maybe we're talking about top five quarterback in the league in a couple of years, and maybe he actually plays up to expectations, which are mm-hmm. tough because you had Aaron Rodgers in front of you. And if you think about it, Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers to Jordan Love, it was the same thing, right? Uh, no, but you know what? As much as you know, Favre never relinquished his role over to Rodgers. Rodgers, at the very least, you know, he didn't exactly relinquish his role. But if I'm not mistaken, I think Rodgers was a little more receptive and willing to help Love than Favre was to him. Here and there until all the attitude stuff happened. But I just want to point out some other numbers as well in this game, which are shocking. Mm -hmm. And Cowboys fans are just probably the worst fans in the history of the NFL. Look at the receiving for this game for the Cowboys. CeeDee Lamb, nine receptions, 110 yards. Michael Gallup, six receptions, 103 yards. Jake Ferguson, 10 receptions, 93 yards, three touchdowns. This was Jake Ferguson's game, yeah. I don't want to hear shit from Cowboys fans, okay? You can't blame this, as you would say, on the offense. The offense came to play. They they got out-offensed by Jordan Love. Well, yeah, they got out-offensed by Jordan Love, absolutely. And something, like I said, if you want to crap on them, Nick, that offense for the first half, actually, that, that actually is fair. The second half, though, I mean, the game was already blown out by that point, but at least they tried to show some spirit. But when you're in a position where you have, one, like I said, when you have one of the top defenses in this league and you give up 48 points in a game, that's a downright disappointment and you're not going to win. The other stat, 8-0 and at home before that game. Are but you, you know, kidding me, Dallas? But you know what? Now the Packers are 4-0 at AT&T Stadium, beating them, I think it was like twice in the regular season, something like twice in the regular season, maybe twice or once in the playoffs. And that Super Bowl win that Fat Rodgers in 2011, that took place at AT&T Stadium. That's right. Um, the Packers, but- at this point, Nick, the Packers are the Cowboys' daddy. Yeah, which is kind of nuts. But just to go back to all the pieces coming in place quickly for – Green Bay, Aaron Jones, 21 carries, 118 yards, three touchdowns. He had a coming out party. Especially, Nick, on a season that he, I would consider a disappointment. Oh, it was a downright disappointment with all the injuries. Also, 
Romeo Dobbs. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I mean, like six receptions, 151 yards, and a touchdown. He finally woke up out of the weeds, which no one knew. <laughs> but when you have Aaron Jones and you have Romeo Dobbs going, that's scary. That's a scary combination, along with Jordan Love. I mean, if they're going to play like that, they might give the Niners a run. I'm not saying they're going to win, but make it. Competitive make it uh, I hope it's competitive. I don't want to see a like in this game a 27 to seven going into the half. I guarantee you. Like who was uh, broadcasting the game? It was uh, Burkhardt and Olsen. I think we're calling the yeah. game. What were they thinking at the half? 27 to seven, Green Bay. Ah, Nick, Jimmy Johnson went on a whole tirade at halftime. And you know what? I don't blame them either because that that team deserved a swift kick in the ass the way they were playing. Mm -hmm. But and you then know Nick, what? And then yeah. Nick, speaking of the kick, should we talk about the kicker and all of this? Yes. Mike McCarthy staying. <laughs> I mean, this is not a surprise. How about them Cowboys? Like it's I I wanted my coach back. I didn't want to give him up. Well, well, yeah, but you know what's funny? McCarthy, the reports were that in the locker room during exit interview day, McCarthy was sympathetic, and it seemed like Jerry was like, unacceptable. We can't have a loss like this. And yeah, Jerry, I, Jerry, if I'm not mistaken, Nick was crying in his yeah, post interview. I, I did hear that. Well, I don't know if I believe Jerry ever cries. I don't think Jerry has an emotional bone in his body, but this is what I think of the Cowboys right now. So, yeah, that's what I think of the team right now. They're a dysfunctional mess. I did see a video of him walking into the locker room, like doing the saunter walk after losing a, a playoff game. I, we all know Jerry's done that walk before. He's used to doing that walk because mm -hmm. they just can't win a major game. And this wasn't a pressure game. That's what's so scary about this whole thing. Yeah. Like, if they were playing the Niners... Or if they were playing, I don't know, the Ravens, fine. You lose to those teams, those are those teams are probably better than you. Nick, I'm just going to take the words of my friend from about an hour ago. Uh, false denial is a hell of a drug. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Were there any other games left? Uh, yeah, just very quickly. Uh, Rams versus the Lions. The Lions win 24-23. I think that was probably the best game of this whole weekend. It was so competitive back and Good forth. Good for Jared Goff, though. Like, totally, the Lions, uh, what was it, the first time since the 80s or something? like 90s, I think. that they Or 90s. Play. It's been a long time since they've won a playoff game. Good and for the, Campbell. And the best part, Nick, because the Cowboys lost, that means they get to host another home game. They get to host the divisional round. It's amazing and, how I, karma works out. And there's a chance, Nick. There's and that means there's a chance that after all this time away from the playoffs, Nick, they could be playing for the NFC Championship. But the first thing they'll have to do is they'll have to get past the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who outright crushed the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, wait, let's hold let hold that for a second because I wanted to say a few things about the Lions game. But like, yeah. Jared Goff played well, like really well, and. Like, he deserves all the credit in the world, like, keeping this team in it. Because that was a slugfest starting in the first quarter. Touchdown, field goal, touchdown, touchdown, field goal. Like, it was back and forth. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, it was 14-3 to Detroit in the first. And then it was kind of a reverse quarter in the second. So it was 21-17 going to the half. That was competitive. Like, it took a lot. And you know what? The Lions deserve it. They played good football. Um, Amron Sam Brown came out and had the perfect game. Seven receptions, 110 yards. Uh, the, the running tandem needs some work, but I think I said it on Football Friday that Montgomery and Gibbs need to come prepared if they're going to win games. Otherwise, I just don't see them winning games. Um, Matthew Stafford did the exact thing. I Remember I said to you either he's going to throw for 300-plus yards and a couple touchdowns, yeah. Usually when that happens, he wins. He wins games. Well, not only that, Nick. Um, hold on. I had a note from this game that I need to pull up on the score. Oh, yeah. 
uh, Puka Nakua sets the single game NFL playoff record for most receiving yards by a rookie with 181 yards in this game. Yeah, in the in the fourth quarter especially, they could not stop him. Like I thought they were going to blow the game because of the way he was getting the football. And and that's the thing. Like he set that in a loss. So you know, it says, does it stink for Stafford to come back to his old home and lose like that? Yeah, but you know what? What this season has showed me, especially on an Another another year that was supposed to be a down year for L.A. With him at the helm and now with a solid one-two punch in Cup and uh, Nakua, they they should have a bright future ahead of them as well. And McVay. Yeah, I mean, and like... McVay coaching them, yeah. And by the way, I need to call out one thing. There's, there was quite a few things that happened in a few of these games. Shame on the Lion fans for booing Matt Stafford. Uh, and I also read a report... That they booed his daughters who were sitting in the crowd. Are you kidding me? That's that's shameful. And like, I had I I, I, I don't I, care. Now, I don't care. Just, like th- come on. Th- that sours that sours it. It's like now I want to, you know, feel good for the Lions, but that after that, now that you just said that, it's like it look, now that you just said that, if Tampa Bay beats them next week, that's gonna be that's gonna be karma. Yeah, I mean it, don't get me wrong. I understand fans are fans, but don't. What did they do? They didn't do anything to you. Yeah, no, that's awful. I don't know. And was, and his, girl, his girls are what? Like, they have to be five, six years old. They're kids. <laughs> they're young kids. Right. I mean, and I guarantee you, like, they're sitting there saying, wait, whoa, what? Like, what's going on here? Like, why are we getting booed? We yeah. didn't do anything. So, no, <laughs> apparently what happened was. They apparently at home, this was from the sidelines. I think it was the Starks reporting it, that they watch both Rams and Lions games at home because of Stafford's connections to both teams. And uh, apparently the girls asked uh, Matt Just Stafford, to go to the oh, game. Yeah. yeah. No, about like, you know, well, what do we, you know, what do we do? Who do we root for? They were very confused. And she said, in this case, we root for daddy. Yeah. Well, yeah, that makes total sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, and by the way, it was cool on the positive end to end this game on a positive note, when uh, Jared Goff was in the uh, truck being driven and you just see the fans like high-fiving through the truck like that. Yeah. That was kind of fun. Um, but no, this was probably the best game. And now if you want to go to the other game, all right, the, the thrashing game, the thrashing that the Buccaneers put on the Philadelphia Eagles. And again, you know, anything that I do can't be stopped, but I mean, can't be, can't top what uh tree did the 2024 edition of die eagles die that was great i mean and on top of that how many of us because i think we kind of split on that pick of that game well no we all a bunch of us said the bugs zan tried to defend and said that he thought that the eagles were gonna win oops um <laughs> I don't know. I, I I remember saying it. I I don't remember the exact quote I said on football Friday, but I think I said like the Eagles just the momentum is gone. Yeah. And Nick D said it was a reverse momentum going on. And he's right. And that's what happened. Okay. Nick, they won one game. <laughs> they went ten and one. And then they finished the season one and one seven, seven, right? Right. Yeah, one I uh, one and six, and then add in the playoff loss for the one and seven. Yeah. And and that one win came against the Giants on Christmas Day. And they nearly choked that one. So you're saying that they almost didn't win a game the rest of the year. Yes. <clears throat> I'm just looking at the numbers. So Baker Mayfield outplayed Jalen Hurts. Think of wait, wait, wait. Let me say that one more time. Okay. Baker Mayfield, Mayfield. outplayed Jalen Hurts. And that's with Baker Mayfield getting sacked four times in this game. And being hurt. People forget that Baker's been dealing with, I think, hip issues and a bunch of other stuff. But Baker Mayfield, 22 for 36, 337 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. Nick, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin weren't even, I mean, they both had 40-something yards apiece. They were not existent. Let's be real. Cade Otten, the tight end. You lost to Kate Odd and Baker Mayfield. Which and they're talented, see. which Baker and Kate have, you know, great talent, but you're the Philadelphia damn Eagles. You were supposed to be one of the top teams in this goddamn league. Now, 
not that I'm making excuses, but AJ Brown was out, obviously. Um, again, I could care less because I don't, I, I don't like the Eagles after uh, what Nick Sirianni was bullshitting all, all over the sideline with, and I have another one uh, for that one as well. Um, I don't know. This game was over, in my opinion, after the half. Yeah, so the score at the half was 16-9. to nine, So, I mean, it was still a one-score game, but still it seemed like Tampa Bay had all the momentum. And then, but then, Nick, uh, late in the third quarter, Jalen Hurts' intentional grounding penalty for a safety. One minute later, Trey Palmer goes 56 yards for a touchdown. <laughs> at that point, that back-to-back, it's like, okay, yeah, that's one's done. Wait a minute, was that the garbage time touchdown or no? No, that was uh, Godwin in the fourth. The one where they totally deked you with the camera angle. Yeah. <laughs> the, I, I just, when I saw that happen, that touchdown, I was at up the, that's the cherry on top. Like the Eagles are just getting embarrassed. And like, again, Devonta Smith, great game. Eight receptions, 148 yards. But after that, the second leading receiver was DeAndre Swift. Are you kidding? No, not kidding. Julio so, Jones was next. Three receptions, 22 yards. Here, think, this, this is what yeah. happened to Philadelphia fans for the second half. Of the Emotional season. damage. It's it's true. I mean, or better yet, this is what Eagle fans were thinking. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. So guess what? He stinks. But guess what? Nick Sirianni's going to be back as well. Well, I want to point something else out because this was another observation that happened after the game. When the Eagles were jogging off the field, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but a Eagles fan that was sitting like corner right where the, um, the locker rooms are dumped a full large popcorn on Nick Sirianni as he was going into the locker room after the game was over. Oh, my God. And on top of that, security was right on him as he tried to run up the stairs. Stupid is as stupid does. By the way, and I was joking with some people last night, uh, the other night. Do you realize that was probably an expensive bucket of popcorn? Yeah. I I don't know why you would use, like, I, I laugh, but I don't know why you would use that stuff in the way like that because... Refreshments at stadiums are expensive as hell. Especially in the playoffs. Forget it. Mm, I mean, I, I want to eat that freaking popcorn. I've been taking 12 or 13 bucks and throwing it down the drain and dumping it on a coach's head. Could you imagine, Nick? Could you imagine just... I mean, it's a it's a damn waste of food, an expensive waste of food, because that popcorn, probably $10, $15. Beer's probably about $15. Chicken tender bucket's probably... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, considering, twenty bucks. Stadium, considering Yankee Stadium price and trying to price it into the trying to do the math to pace it in an NFL playoff stadium, probably twenty twenty five bucks. Oh Jesus! But you know what? The Eagles just embarrassed themselves, and now we see this report from Diana Rossini that uh, GM Howie Roseman and head coach Nick Sirianni have been reaching out to available NFL coaches and coordinators. This basically says to you, "Ah, eh, don't worry about the loss. We'll we'll just wipe that from our memory like it never happened." Again, false denial is a hell of a drug. Yeah, really. I mean, don't get me wrong. Is Nick Sirianni a great coach? No. Is he a good coach? Yes. yes. Like, And the Eagles have talent, but it's just, in my mind, it's unacceptable that you go from 10-1 and 1 to out in the wild card round. I mean, you freaking lost to the Bucks. No offense, by the way. Let, I, let me make sure I give a positive spin to the Bucks because they played great. And Baker Mayfield deserves a contract no, from the Bucks. No. Yeah, this is, again, in a, in a similar but maybe different kind of light with the Browns Texas game. This is not about the Bucks in this case and their capabilities. This is about the collapse of the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, the Eagles were a disgrace. Like, and I and I use that word uh, in a huge way because they just played terrible football down the stretch. And everyone said, oh, well, they'll figure it out. They're the Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly, Eagles. Like... And I'm like, G -G -L -E -S -E -S. yeah, right. And <laughs> everyone, oh, we're going to win. We'll go back to the Super Bowl again. We'll show everybody. Yeah. Okay. 
and Jalen Hurts, who couldn't even hold up a middle finger, quite literally or figuratively, however you want to put that, um, couldn't throw the football. And to add insult to injury, did you see Dallas Godart get hurt at the end of the game? Yeah. Like, everyone was getting hurt. Darius Slay got hurt towards the end of the game. The Eels were falling apart. Cursed. That team was cursed. Oh, uh, man. And then one last thing. Uh, Steelers did their best, but ultimately could not overcome the wintry conditions over in Buffalo. Snowball uh, gate, as I like to yeah. call it. Um, by the way, shame on the Steelers fans. Uh, uh, not Steelers fans. Bills okay. fans for throwing snowballs to George Pickens as he's trying to catch a ball yeah, in the end zone. Um, Mike Garofalo, by the way, reporting that Steelers, we're going to go three for three. Steelers head coach, Mike Tomlin. The plan is for him to return for 2024. This, uh, him and McCarthy, by the way, would be on the last years of their contracts. By the way, and this just made me laugh. His press conference after the game. Did you see it or no? Him walking off? Yeah. In the middle of the question, as the reporter said, uh, all right, Mike, I know it's the last year your contract gone. <laughs> listen, listen, I get it. You may not want to answer that question. That was the but, wrong choice. But uh, maybe that was the wrong choice to question, Nick, in in your mind. But it might oh, no, be. No, 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 no. Oh, That's not what okay, I'm talking about. Off. Okay, I'm walking yeah. off. Yeah. yeah. You could have just said, guys, we're just coming off of a major loss. Not now. Let's talk about the game. Yes, 100%. That's exactly where I was going with it, that you have to ask the question because, again, who knows? He's been with the team for, what, 15, 16 years? And by the way, losing season, that was the incredible stat. Like he has not had one losing season, which is rare. You don't see that, especially with all the quarterback changes you go through and everything. That's the thing. It's it's the storyline of the team at this point is the future about Mike Tomlin. Now, their quarterback situation is a mess because of. Pickett constantly getting hurt. Um, I don't know where you go with the quarterback situation. Like, I don't know what the direction of the that the Steelers go in. I mean, they have some pieces, but nothing that brings them over the top. And they play in a tough division. Talk again, Nick. The AFC North only division, first division since the 1930s to have every team finish above 500. And that's I mean, with and that's with players unhealthy. So. When Burrow comes back for the Bengals, when Chubb comes back for the Browns, what is this division going to look like? Now, yeah. I think Mason Rudolph has earned a spot, at least on as the backup. If obviously because they're going to go back to pick it, sure. but like he took that team way further than they probably should have gone. And you got to give credit to that, yeah. And for the Bills, like you said, you know they got a home game against the Chiefs next week, which is going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, the Bills played a, uh, played good football. I wouldn't say it was perfect no. by any means. I mean, I look at the box score. Josh Allen played probably his best game in a long time without throwing a pick. Um, 21 for 30, 203 yards is not that impressive to me, at least. Um, I obviously had the three uh, touchdowns. I think two of them were early in the first quarter, if I'm not mistaken. One was off the interception I that think. was thrown, and the other one was just a deep throw, which the Steelers just fell asleep on the uh, go route, uh, corner route in the end zone. Um, James Cook was all right, 18 carries, 79 yards, but no one really stood out receiving wise. Dalton Kincaid was the leader, three receptions, 59 yards, and a touchdown, but that was it. Um, I don't, the Steelers were not supposed to win this game. This is the one game we knew was a mismatch by far. Yeah. So that's basically it. All right, one last thing, by the way, just quickly shout out to Eagle center, Jason Kelsey. And going back to the Eagles loss, it's a shame that that's going to be the last game on Jason Kelsey's career, because for all of his pro bowl performances at the center position, all the time he spent being a part of that 2018 super bowl team, he deserved a lot better. Than that, actually, I think he was one of the last pieces, if not the last piece of that Super Bowl team. I think that's what I was thinking of earlier. Yeah, that's it. Um, and by the way, he's probably getting out at the right time because they're changing the tush push rule. Which, by the way, we have to give him credit, like because being the center and trying to make that play work. Yeah, 
Oh, but which, by the way, is another credit to the Buccaneers. They actually stopped the tush push. The two point conversion stop told you all, like told that told everybody that the Bucks meant business in that game. Um, Kelsey will be fine. He will continue to do the podcast with his brother. I think I think TV will be in his future somewhere. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he wants to do TV because he's more the personality based person, not the analytical based right. type player. Could you imagine, Nick? Um, after Travis retires eventually. That you have both a Manning cast and a Kelsey cast, or they're together, or something like that. Or I could see them doing like one of the booths, uh, like where they have the Kelsey bro- uh, brothers in with whoever is the play-by-play, yeah. like they do with the McCordy twins or whatever. Yeah, uh, I could see them doing that too. Like, I don't know. The NFL's got a lot of interesting players that could be good broadcast analysts, even if it's just personality based. They got but, yeah, they got great personalities, which is why do you need to let those personalities shine through? Which I think the NFL has done a better job in recent years of letting some of these personalities shine through. See, the NFL, and I can't believe I'm gonna say this, the NFL has actually done it well when they said go out there, be a personality. Rob Manfred should learn a thing or two about this. Right. Uh, but um, <laughs> but Roger doesn't get in the way. Oh, I want to make my money. I want my billions. Go out there and be you. That's how it should be done. And if the NFL does that, Silver and the NBA do it. It's just a matter of Mr. Manfred and his Major League Baseball that got to get that uh, got to get that step up. All I could say is Mike Trout, uh, which ironically, a Eagles fan. Um, that's a great way of boot to add for that full circle. Um, before we go, announcement for stream. Uh, the Empty the Bench Network live stream for the NFL Divisional Round. Buccaneers at the Lions. We had a couple choices, but this one's not terrible. Like, the Lions... Right. I think it's a matter of, upon the discussion with other hosts here at the network, the historical significance that the Lions are playing for the Divisional, in the Divisional Round for the first time in many years, and the significance of this playoff run. And like I said earlier, if they get a win, then that means the Lions... And very quickly are going to be back into an NFC championship game for the first time in a long time. And the Buccaneers, you know, in a year where pretty weak, like one of these two teams, Nick, it's it was shocking to say, but because of that Cowboys loss, one of these two teams is going to be playing for the conference title. Which is kind of sick in that regard, thinking about Baker Mayfield, who, who will get paid. I will say that a million times until yes. it becomes a broken record. He deserves to be paid. This guy, one of a uh, few even quarterbacks. If not, even if it's not a long-term extension, he deserves a few years. With, I could see him getting like a two-plus-one type situation. Yeah. But one of very few quarterbacks this year to start all 17 games. Mm-hmm. Think about that. With all the quarterbacks that we've had. And all, and all of his injuries that he wasn't healthy. So... Unbelievable, like unbelievable job, like for Baker Mayfield, because like, where was he a couple of years ago? Like everyone, when the Browns, when the Browns traded for Deshaun Watson, everyone wanted to write Baker off, especially as after in and in that season he tried to play through injury. And I now don't blame here, people for writing him off either. He was not good at one point. Like, well, he's found himself. You know, Nick, this is going to sound sick for you as a Jets fan, but under Todd Bowles, he has found himself in Tampa Bay. <laughs> but but in Tampa they are a more defensive focused team, I feel like at least. Now, uh, I think there's not as much pressure in Tampa as there is in New York, but that's a whole different story uh for another day. But make sure you join us for the stream Sunday. The game starts at 3, so I guess yeah. we'll be on like 2:40, 2:45 uh before the game. We'll do everything. We have a bunch of people I know uh, Zan and Ben and all our guys from our different shows. Uh, we have quite a few that are. So we'll have. It won't just be you and I for a change uh, in the game. So we'll have a an ensemble cast uh, joining us as well. Just uh, one more announcement as well. Uh, Hitting for the Cycle is officially ready to be back. Um, we a- After all the pop up circumstance that went on around. Uh, certain issues we have with the show. 
Ben oh, Cruz will be taking the co-host spot with Ryan Tui. That show's coming back the first week of February. So hitting for the cycle is back uh, in full force. As believe it or not, the baseball season's not that far away. As scary as yeah. that sounds. So we're gonna have to do baseball previews soon. Oi, oi. Um, but that'll do it. <laughs> Make sure you follow us on social media at ETB Sports, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ETB Sports. Follow the Empty the Bench Podcast Network at ETB Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at ETB Network. You want to follow us? He's at Thomas J. Alvado. I'm at N Morgan Radio for our personal social media handles, uh, audio platforms, Acast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on all the platforms. Uh, follow our website as well, etbpodcast.com. Uh, for all the latest blogs and information as well. And also make sure uh, follow Wolf Spreads uh, across our network uh, as we've expanded to a full network partnership with them as well. So, uh, whew, okay, I think I'm, I'm out of breath. So if you want to finish yeah. here, you can. Okay. Or Nick Morgison on Tom Vanna. We'll see you next week on episode 217 of Empty the Bench. So take care, everyone. Till then. Good night, everybody. Good night. We'll see you next week. Good night.